Section 9 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M.J. Frank. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. Chapter 9. The Newfoundland Dog. Part 3. Some dogs are of an extremely jealous disposition, and the following extraordinary instance of it was communicated to me by Mr. Charles Davis, the well-known and highly respected huntsman of Her Majesty's Stag Hounds, a man who has gained many friends, and perhaps never lost one, by his well-regulated conduct and sporting qualifications. He informed me that a friend of his had a fine Newfoundland dog, which was a great favorite with the family. While this dog was confined in the yard, a pet lamb was given to one of the children, which the former soon discovered to be sharing a great portion of those caresses which he had been in the habit of receiving. This circumstance produced so great an effect on the poor animal that he refused to eat, and fretted till he became extremely unwell. Thinking that exercise might be of use to him, he was let loose. No sooner was this done than the dog watched his opportunity and seized the lamb in his mouth. He was seen conveying it down a lane about a quarter of a mile from his master's house, at the bottom of which the river Thames flowed. On arriving at it, he held the lamb under water till it was drowned, and thus effectually got rid of his rival. On examining the lamb, it did not appear to have been bitten, or otherwise injured, and it might almost be supposed that the dog had chosen the easiest death in removing the object of his dislike. The sense of these animals is indeed perfectly wonderful. A lieutenant in the Navy informed me that while his ship was under sail in the Mediterranean, a favorite canary bird escaped from its cage and flew into the sea. A Newfoundland dog on board witnessed the circumstance, immediately jumped into the sea, and swam to the bird, which he seized in his mouth, and then swam back with it to the ship. On arriving on board and opening the dog's mouth, it was found that the bird was perfectly uninjured, so tenderly had it been treated, as though the dog had been aware that the slightest pressure would have destroyed it. Mr. Uat whose remarks on the usefulness and good qualities of the inferior animals in his work on humanity to brutes do him so much credit, gives the following anecdote as a proof of the reasoning power of a Newfoundland dog. Wanting one day to go through a tall iron gate from one part of his premises to another, he found a lame puppy lying just within it, so that he could not get in without rolling the poor animal over and perhaps injuring it. Mr. Uat stood for a while, hesitating what to do, and at length determined to go round through another gate. A fine Newfoundland dog, however, who had been waiting patiently for his wanted caresses, and perhaps wondering why his master did not get in as usual, looked accidentally down at his lame companion. He comprehended the whole business in a moment, put down his great paw, and as gently and quickly as possible rolled the invalid out of the way, and then drew himself back in order to leave room for the opening of the gate. We may be inclined to deny reasoning faculties to dogs, but if this was not reason, it may be difficult to define what else it could be. Mr. Uad also says that his own experience furnishes him with an instance of memory and gratitude of a Newfoundland dog, who was greatly attached to him. He says, as it became inconvenient to him to keep the dog, he gave him to one he knew would treat him kindly. Four years passed, and he had not seen him. When one day, as he was walking towards Kingston, and had arrived at the brow of the hill where Jerry Abershaw's gibbet then stood, he met Carlo and his master. The dog recollected Mr. Uat in a moment, and they made much of each other. 
his master after a little chat proceeded towards wandsworth and carlo as in duty bound followed him mr hewitt had not however got halfway down the hill when the dog was again at his side lowly but deeply growling and every hair bristling on looking about he saw two ill-looking fellows making their way through the bushes which occupied the angular space between roehampton and wandsworth roads their intention was scarcely questionable and indeed a week or two before he had narrowly escaped from two miscreants like them i can scarcely say proceeds mr Uatt, what i felt for presently one of the scoundrels emerged from the bushes not twenty yards from me but he no sooner saw my companion and heard his growling the loudness and depth of which were fearfully increasing then he retreated and i saw no more of him or of his associate my gallant defender accompanied me to the direction post at the bottom of the hill and there with many a mutual and honest greeting we parted and he bounded away to overtake his rightful owner we never met again but i need not say that i often thought of him with admiration and gratitude it is pleasing to record such instances of kindness in a brute here we see a recollection of and gratitude for previous good treatment and that towards one whom the dog had not seen for four years there is a sort of bewilderment in the human mind when we come to analyze the feelings affections and peculiar instinctive faculties of dogs a french writer m blaise has asserted that the dog most undoubtedly has all the qualities of a man possessed of good feeling and adds that man has not the fine qualities of the dog we make a virtue of that gratitude which is nothing more than a duty incumbent upon us while it is an inherent quality in the dog canis gratus est et amicite memor we repudiate ingratitude and yet every one is more or less guilty of it indeed where shall we find the man who is free from it take however the first dog you meet with and the moment he has adopted you for his master from that moment you are sure of his gratitude and affection he will love you without calculating what he shall gain by it his greatest pleasure will be to be near you and should you be reduced to beg your bread no poverty will induce him to abandon you your friends may and probably will do so the object of your love and attachment will not perhaps like to encounter poverty with you your wife by some possibility it is a rare case however if she has received kind treatment may forget her vows but your dog will never leave you he will either die at your feet or if he should survive you will accompany you to the grave an intelligent correspondent to whom i am indebted for some sensible remarks on the faculties of dogs has remarked that large-headed dogs are generally possessed of superior faculties to others this fact favors the phrenological opinion that size of brain is evidence of superior power he has a dog possessing a remarkably large head and few dogs can match him in intelligence he is a cross with a newfoundland breed and besides his cleverness in the field as a retriever he shows his sagacity at home in the performance of several useful feats one consists in carrying messages if a neighbor is to be communicated with the dog is always ready to be the bearer of a letter he will take orders to the workmen who reside at a short distance from the house and will scratch impatiently at their door when so employed although at other times desirous of sharing the warmth of their kitchen fire he would wait patiently and then entering with a seriousness befitting the imagined importance of his mission would carefully deliver the note never returning without having discharged his trust his usefulness in recovering articles accidentally lost has often been proved as he is not always allowed to be present at dinner he will bring a hat 
book, or anything he can find, and hold it in his mouth as a sort of apology for his intrusion. He seems pleased at being allowed to lead his master's horse to the stable. Newfoundland dogs may readily be taught to rescue drowning persons. In France this forms a part of their education, and they are now kept in readiness on the banks of the Seine, where they form a sort of humane society corps. By throwing the stuffed figure of a man into a river, and requiring the dog to fetch it out, he is soon taught to do so when necessary, and thus he is able to rescue drowning persons. This hint might not be thrown away on our own excellent humane society. Many dogs are called of the Newfoundland breed who have but small relationship with that sensible animal. The St. John's and Labrador dogs are also very different from each other. The former is strong in his limbs, rough-haired, small in the head, and carries his tail very high. The other, by far the best for every kind of shooting, is often black than of another color, and scarcely bigger than a pointer. He is made rather long in the head and nose, pretty deep in the chest, very fine in the legs, has short or smooth hair, does not carry his tail so much curled as the other, and is extremely quick and active in running, swimming, or fighting. The St. John's breed of these dogs is chiefly used on their native coast by fishermen. Their sense of smelling is scarcely to be credited. Their discrimination of scent in following a wounded pheasant through a whole covert full of game appears almost impossible. The real Newfoundland dog may be broken into any kind of shooting, and without additional instruction is generally under such command that he may be safely kept in if required to be taken out with pointers. For finding wounded game of every description, there is not his equal in the canine race, and he is sine qua non in the general pursuit of wild fowl. These dogs should be treated gently, and much encouraged when required to do anything, as their faults are easily checked. If used roughly, they are apt to turn sulky, they will also recollect and avenge an injury. A traveller on horseback, in passing through a small village in Cumberland, observed a Newfoundland dog reposing by the side of the road, and from mere wantonness gave him a blow with his whip. The animal made a violent rush at and pursued him a considerable distance, having to proceed through the same place the next journey, which was about twelve months afterwards, and while in the act of leading his horse, the dog, no doubt recollecting his former assailant, instantly seized him by the boot and bit his leg. Some persons, however, coming up, rescued him from further injury. A gamekeeper had a Newfoundland dog which he used as a retriever. Shooting in a wood one day, he killed a pheasant which fell at some distance, and he sent his dog for it. When halfway to the bird, he suddenly returned, refusing to go beyond the place at which he had first stopped. This being an unusual circumstance, the man endeavored more and more to enforce his command, which being unable to effect either by words or his whip, he at last, in a great passion, gave the dog a violent kick in the ribs, which laid it dead at his feet. He then proceeded to pick up the bird, and on returning from the spot, discovered a man concealed in the thicket. He immediately seized him, and upon examination several snares were found on his person. This may be a useful hint to those who are apt to take violent measures with their dogs. A gentleman who had a country house near London discovered on arriving at it one day that he had brought away a key which would be wanted by his family in town. Having an intelligent Newfoundland dog, which had been accustomed to carry things, he sent him back with it. While passing with the key, the animal was attacked by a butcher's dog, against which he made no resistance, but got away from him. After safely delivering the key, he returned to rejoin his master, but stopped in the way at the butcher's shop, 
whose dog again sallied forth. The Newfoundland this time attacked him with a fury, which nothing but revenge could have inspired. Nor did he quit the aggressor till he had killed him. The following fact affords another proof of the extraordinary sagacity of these dogs. A Newfoundland dog of the true breed was brought from that country, and given to a gentleman who resided near Thames Street in London. As he had no means of keeping the animal, except in close confinement, he sent him to a friend in Scotland by a Berwick smack. When he arrived in Scotland, he took the first opportunity of escaping, and though he certainly had never before travelled one yard of the road, he found his way back to his former residence in Fish Street Hill. But in so exhausted a state, that he could only express his joy at seeing his master, and then died. So wonderful is the sense of these dogs, that I have heard of three instances in which they have voluntarily guarded the bedchamber doors of their mistresses during the whole night in the absence of their masters, although on no other occasion did they approach them. The Romans appear to have had a dog which seems to have been very similar in character to our Newfoundland. In the museum at Naples there is an antique bronze discovered amongst the ruins of Herculaneum, which represents two large dogs dragging from the sea some apparently drowned persons. The following interesting fact affords another instance of the sagacity and good feeling of the Newfoundland dog. In the year 1841, as a laborer named Rake in the parish of Botley near Southampton was at work in a gravel pit, the top stratum gave way, and he was buried up to his neck by the great quantity of gravel which fell upon him. He was at the same time so much hurt, two of his ribs being broken, that he found it impossible to make any attempt to extricate himself from his perilous situation. Indeed, nothing could be more fearful than the prospect before him. No one was within hearing of his cries, nor was any one likely to come near the spot. He must almost inevitably have perished, had it not been for a Newfoundland dog belonging to his employer. This animal had been watching the man at his work for some days, as if he had been aware that his assistance would be required, for no particular attachment to each other had been exhibited on either side. As soon, however, as the accident occurred, the dog jumped into the pit and commenced removing the gravel with his paws and this he did in so vigorous and expeditious a manner that the poor man was at length able to liberate himself, though with extreme difficulty. What an example of kindness, sensibility, and, I may add, reason, does this instance afford us. A gentleman in Ireland had a remarkably fine and intelligent Newfoundland dog named Boatswain, whose acts were the constant theme of admiration. On one occasion, an aged lady who resided in the house, and the mother-in-law of the owner of the dog, was indisposed and confined to her bed. The old lady was tired of chickens and other productions of the farmyard, and a consultation was held in her room as to what could be procured to please her fancy for dinner. Various things were mentioned and declined, in the midst of which Boatswain, who was greatly attached to the old lady, entered her room with a fine young rabbit in his mouth, which he laid at the foot of the bed, wagging his tail with great exultation. It is not meant to infer that the dog knew anything of the difficulty of finding a dinner to the lady's taste, but seeing her distressed in mind and body, it is not improbable that he had brought his offering in the hopes of pleasing her. On another occasion, his master found this dog early one summer's morning keeping watch over an unfortunate countryman who was standing with his back to a wall in the rear of the premises, pale with terror. He was a simple, honest creature living in the neighborhood. Having to attend some fair or market about four o'clock in the morning, he made a short cut through the grounds, 
which were under the protection of Boatswain, who drove the intruder to the wall and kept him there showing his teeth and giving a growl whenever he offered to stir from the spot. In this way he was kept a prisoner till the owner of the faithful animal released him. There was a Newfoundland dog on board HMS Bellona, which kept the deck during the Battle of Copenhagen, running backward and forward with so brave an anger that he became a greater favorite with the men than ever. When the ship was paid off after the Peace of Amiens, the sailors had a parting dinner on shore. Victor was placed in the chair and fed with roast beef and plum pudding, and the bill was made out in Victor's name. This anecdote is taken from Southey's Omniana. I am indebted to a kind correspondent for the following anecdotes. A friend of mine, who in the time of the war commanded the sea fencibles in the neighborhood of Southend, possessed in those days a magnificent Newfoundland dog named Venture. This noble creature my friend was accustomed to take with him in the pursuit of wild fowl. One cold evening, after having tolerable sport, the dog was suddenly missed. He had been last seen when in pursuit of a winged bird. As the ice was floating in the river, and the dog was true to his name, and would swim any distance for the recovery of wounded game, it was feared he must have fallen a victim to the hazards of the sport, and his owner returned home in consequence much dispirited. On his arrival at his house, what was his extreme surprise on entering the drawing-room to find his wife accompanied by the dog and a fine mallard lying on the table the lady had on her part been overwhelmed with anxiety by the dog's having returned alone some time before knowing the frequently perilous amusement in which her husband had embarked the dog had straight on his return rushed to the drawing-room where the lady sat and had laid the wild duck at her feet having brought it safely in his mouth several miles. A gentleman once sent a coat to the tailor to be mended. It was left upon a counter in the shop. His dog had accompanied the servant to the tailor's. The animal watched his opportunity, pulled the coat down from the counter, and brought it home in triumph to his master. There is a tendency in the pride of man to deny the power of reasoning in animals, while it is the belief of some that reason is often a more sure guide to the brute beast for the purposes designed by providence than that of their detractors. The fact is, I think, few persons who reflect deny the power in a degree to the less gifted of nature's works. Certainly not some of the wisest of our race. Bishop Butler, in his analogy, I think, assumes it, while the following beautiful inscription, designed for the epitaph of a favorite Newfoundland dog, was penned by no less a person than the late wise and venerable Earl of Eldon. From it his views on this subject may, I fancy, be easily discerned. They are published in the life of him, written by Horace Twiss. You who wander hither, pass not unheeded the spot where poor Caesar is deposited. To his rank among created beings, the power of reasoning is denied. Caesar manifested joy for days before his master arrived at Encombe. Caesar manifested grief for days before his master left it. What name shall be given to that faculty which thus made expectation a source of joy, which thus made expectation a source of grief? End of section 9 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon